recording. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart, for that wonderful presentation. And good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Hilda, uh, can you please share the screen for us? And we're going to start sharing very, very soon. Here we go. Thank you so much, Hilda. And today we're going to be uh, presenting about social emotional learning and English language teaching considerations for language teachers and teacher educators. In our presentation today, it's going to um, very quickly uh, before we, we start and, and share a little bit of uh, our agenda for today, we want to do a quick poll and, and just briefly ask you uh, which of these possible options best uh, describes you or identifies you. And if you can please write in the chat box. In, um, and as you do this, I want to share with you that we are um, interested in, in having a conversation with you. So not in lecturing. So we will have a lot of um, different uh, prompts and quick polls and things to keep you engaged throughout the presentation. So um, let's see here, higher education, teacher training, higher education, K through 12, adult education, well, Hilda, I think we have a pretty uh, mixed uh, K through 12 middle school. Wonderful. Private yeah, academy. Yeah, great. Excellent, excellent. We have a little bit here for everyone. So this is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, here's our agenda for today. And uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about teacher well being, because when we think about social emotional learning, we have to think about teacher well-being. I don't want to give away, we have a, an activity here that we're gonna do, but uh, I don't wanna give away too much, but uh, that will be the first part. Then we're going to talk about social emotional learning. What is it? Then why? Why incorporate social emotional learning? And then part four, how? How to do it? Practical applications. Okay, and the first part is teacher well-being in social emotional learning. So which of these do you consider most essential for social emotional learning? So when we look at these four elements, the curriculum, the students, the administrators, the teachers, which of these four do you think is the most essential, the, more, the most vi vital for social emotional learning? We have here some responses. Thank you so much. We have Andrew, Andre, thank you. Gracia, thank you. BCD, David, D. Well, I think uh, the most popular response is D, which is, it's wonderful. Um, sometimes when we ask this question, uh, we get mixed responses, but certainly I think everybody can make a case for uh, all of these, um, each of them, um, each of the responses, being uh, essential for social emotional learning. For example, without students, you don't have social emotional learning, without curriculum, without administrator. But in, in our belief, we believe that teachers are essential for social emotional learning because without teachers, there is no social emotional learning, there is no teaching. Um, teachers are really the, the lifeblood of educational system. Um, and Sarah Mercer I uses that, that terminology, that phrase. Uh, without teachers, there is no education. So uh, we believe that first, before we focus on social emotional learning, we have to focus on teacher well-being. And um, what is teacher well-being? Well, when we think about teacher well-being, um, I'm going to share some with you, but um, our definition, there are different definitions, different um, um, different ways of approaching teacher well-being in the literature. There isn't one specific um, definition that has been uh, embraced by everyone because everybody has a different take. I apologize one moment. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I have some cold and every now and then I cough a little bit, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, this is our definition that we're using. This is actually part of a definition of a, an upcoming book that we have, it's called Teacher Wellbeing in English Language Teaching. Uh, but the definition that we use for teacher well-being is well-being is a state of equilibrium where individuals experience health, happiness, and prosperity, all of which lead to developing life satisfaction, self-realization, and the ability to engage in socially responsible behaviors, personally, professionally, emotionally, and spiritually. It's important to look at all those four elements that produce long-lasting positive effects. Further, we hold that well-being is not 
an individual duty, but the responsibility of society and ecological systems where individuals reside as a whole. And it's important for us to say this because many times in um, education, traditionally, uh, teacher well-being has been imposed or, or put uh, as, a, as, a, as a responsibility for teachers. And let's go to the next slide. I'll share a little bit more about that. But um, when we think about teacher well-being, have you seen this before? Have you seen this wheel of well-being or wellness wheel? Uh, many times when people think about teacher well-being, for example, they might just look at the salary. Oh, yes, we need to increase teacher salary. Or um, yes, we need to increase, uh, for example, um, having better classrooms. Yes, of course, uh, all of that affects teacher well-being. And of course, affecting teacher well-being is going to affect how teachers react, how teachers, um, teacher practices, how they teach, and it's going to affect student learning as a consequence. But there are many other factors that we have to consider. For example, one factor out of the eight here that we have here um, that I want to bring attention to uh, that is often left out of the conversation is environmental wellness. And there, there are um, research studies out there that show how when um, well-being in general, not only of teachers, but of the society, when the well-being of the society it's lower or it's, it's decreasing, there is a correlation to environmental wellness. So usually when the environment suffers, people's uh, well-being suffer and the other uh, way around as well. So, you know, these are elements and things that we don't think about. And, but bringing it back to uh, teaching and teacher well-being, this is traditionally how well-being has looked like in um, education. Everything revolves around teachers and it seems like everything, like school district requirements, well-being, making sure that the, the school district uh, requirements are met, for example, everything seems to revolve around teachers and administrators putting responsibility on teachers and everyone just putting a lot of responsibility on teachers. We could add many more bubbles here, like parents and you know, um, or society, many, many more bubbles, but teachers are always placed at the center and they're even for um, self-care during the pandemic, for example, there was this uh, practice that they started to do about self-care as a way to uh, put additional responsibilities on teachers, telling them if you don't take care of yourself, then it's your responsibility, then it's your fault because you're not doing enough self-care. But teachers didn't have enough time to self-care. So this is why it is important to bring attention first to teacher well-being and how uh, it should look like, which is the next slide. This is how well-being should look like from an ecological perspective, that the district, the school district should be the one in charge and responsible for the well-being of all stakeholders, including teachers. Teachers should not be the ones responsible for the well-being of the entire system. Um, so again, it is important for us to think about teacher well-being first, because without teacher well-being, there is no social emotional learning. Um, if you haven't seen this, uh, we don't have time to, to do this, but I'm just going to leave this here for you. We'll be glad to share the PowerPoint at the end. Um, but if you haven't taken a well-being assessment, please check it out. And there are many more out there. This is a good one that I've tried with my students and they really liked it. Uh, but again, I'll, we'll be glad to share the PowerPoint with you. We don't have time, but it was something that we just wanted to leave there for you. And also, um, we don't have a lot of time for the next slide either, um, Hilda, but we but can also But I just wanted, to, sh yes, I wanted to share real quick that this well-being assessment, it only takes a few minutes, just so you know, so that you do, in fact, go back to it because it, it does just take maybe like five minutes at the most. And, and it'll give you just kind of a feeling of what are the aspects of well-being and how how well you really are in, in the, you know, five minutes. And it's, it's very important every now and then to do a quick check-in because even when I was, uh, I was doing this with my students, this activity, and they just told me, I've never, um, I've never really thought about my own well-being, you know, especially like in teacher preparation programs, it seems like they're all they're expecting is to talk about how to teach students, but they never focus on themselves. So it's important, especially for teacher educators to think about, okay, how are we prioritizing or even just sharing a spotlight there uh, on, on teacher well-being and, and how they're doing, how our students are doing. So um, again, we don't have a lot of time to go over these three questions uh, because we have a lot more information to share with you, but uh, this is something that um, we just want to leave you here, these three questions. And again, you can go back later and think about them, how important is knowing about your well-being as a learner and or teacher. These are questions that I actually um, use with my students 
I'm, I'm teaching a class about um, emotions and well-being in English language teaching, and we often talk about these things, you know, and, and we do a lot of um, like circles where we talk about teacher well-being, emotions, student well-being, and um, if you're doing um, a course that invites itself to to these questions please use them with your students and let me know how it works for you and um so we just wanted to leave that there for you so maybe you use some meditation with your classes i'm not sure but um but if you haven't this is something that you might want to consider and i like to add the visual of this gif it's on the website de-stress mondays and the reason I like it so much is because it really allows the students to focus and become present. So, for example, if you start the class breathing, you know, as the students come in, you say, okay, we're going to start with our breathing. And then you have them focus on this GIF and as it expands. So let's just take a moment to breathe in and think about the happy thoughts, the good feelings, the fact that it's Sunday, if you're in Korea. And as you blow out, you know, anything negative that you might have been experiencing so that you can be here right now, present with me. And as you breathe in, maybe you think about a goal for the year. And as you breathe out, concentrate on that one goal. And just taking a few minutes with your students really sets the tone. And I find, again, that, that this gift, having this visual with it makes a, makes a big difference. So I highly recommend that you look into the, the De-Stress Monday website. They have different shapes. I like, I like the round shape, but they have stars and they have other triangles, whatever shape you like. So as Luis was talking about wellness and self-care, um, something that, uh, that he was mentioning is that self-care shouldn't all fall on you. So, but the, the important thing is that we remember that we do really need self-care, right? And so I have, um, an example, if you go on an airplane, the flight attendant will always say, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before you put it on the child that you're traveling with, because you have to be able to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And so that's kind of how I see self-care and how we see self-care. So something that I know that works for me very well is to calendarize my day, I call it. And so, um, so because, you know, many times we say, oh, I don't have time, you know, I don't have time to do self-care. I don't have time to exercise because everybody always equates self-care with exercise. But if you think about the things that you really like personally, what works for you, right? Because this is your own self-care, what, how can you fit it in? So this is my example. This is how, what would work for me, you know, for breakfast, I might consider eating something healthy right? And then throwing in a few yoga stretches here and there so that I know that that's something that I really enjoy and makes such a difference. You know, when I go to work, rather than always listening to the news, listening to podcasts, something positive, positive messages, so that when I get there, I feel kind of refreshed. I'm feeling good. Then when I'm teaching, you know, including that meditation that I was just sharing, at lunchtime, again, trying to eat healthy. When I, when I go, you know, have a break, going outside, you know, having that moment to have that sun in your, in your face and, the, you know, the wind going through your hair um, just makes such a difference. And then seeking, seeking others, you know, because it's, we're not in this alone. As Luis was saying, you know, it definitely takes a village. And so for our self-care, it's something that we should go out and seek help you know, talk to our peers, talk to our supervisors, so that we make sure that we get the, the help that we need for self-care. So as, as Luis mentioned earlier, Sarah Mercer's work. So the ecological perspective looks at the micro, meso, and macro levels. So when you think about it, the micro level is like at the individual level. So yes, you yourself can take care of your self-care, but it's more than that, right? We need, the, we need the society, we need our organizations, like I said, our supervisor to be on board to give us, most importantly, the time and the space. And then, you know, getting this into policy so that it becomes something that is not only accepted, but is part of our routine. 
So I know, for example, one of the counties here where I live has made it so that once, a, I think it was once a month, the teachers get together and they have like a half a day where they are supposed to work on self-care as a group. So each team, you know, each grade level is a team and then they, they decide what works for them personally. So that way you can, um, you know, so like, for example, one team said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go hiking and then we're going to have lunch together. And that's what they wanted. That's what makes them feel good. And that's the important thing is that it makes you feel good. But the fact that their organization and their supervisor allowed them the time and the space was awesome. So if you uh, want to hear more about Sarah Mercer's work, there's this um, presentation online that you can see for free. So just look into it and, um, and you can see uh, more information about that. But part of it talks about the, the overlapping layers of what is it that affects teacher well-being. So as I was mentioning, the institution, the personal life, and also the professional life are all going to affect it. So, you know, we really need the, the time and the space to work on that. So what, what is social emotional learning? And so it's basically the, the knowledge, the skills, and the dispositions that our students need to succeed in school, but also outside of school, right beyond school. So out at work in you know, in their life at home. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that go into it. A lot of, there's five different competencies that we're gonna be sharing with you. So quick poll, have you used social emotional learning in your classroom? Can you please say yes or no in the chat box? So we have a no, no, some yes. No, no, okay. Well, hopefully, I don't think so. Maybe by the time that we finish this, um, this talk, you will see that maybe there are some things that you have done and you weren't even aware are social emotional learning. And maybe there are some things that you will consider after hearing from us. So thank you for thank you for letting us know. Oh, and I see uh, Grazia is not in the classroom, but she's in teacher training. Okay, in Honduras, nice. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for responding to that poll. And like Hilda said, we're going to circle back to that poll, and you might surprise you might be surprised um, uh, when we finish this section. But um, as Hilda shared, we're going to be talking about five main competencies for social emotional learning. There are many more uh, approaches to social emotional learning that I'm going to share with you later. But for right now, for this presentation, we're going to be focusing on CASEL's uh, competencies, which is self-awareness, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And um, the first, let, let's go at the first one. Uh, let's look at the first one first, uh, self-awareness and self-awareness it's all about knowing ourselves, our emotions, and how we react to different events, to different scenarios. It's about looking into ourselves and, and our responses, our behaviors to things. Uh, when, when I usually taught um, self-awareness to my students, um, I did different activities um, to, for them to know more about their feelings, about their values, their biases, and um, there are many ways that you can do this, but an example that I can give you, for example, here in the next slide, it's an activity that I really like for self-awareness. It's uh, connected to positive psychology and positive um, de uh, developing positive mindset, positive traits here. We have a list of different traits of positive traits, uh, intelligent, uh, hardworking, loyal, and depending, it depends on the level of your student. Of course, you can make it more difficult um, I usually taught newcomers, that's the level that I like to teach the most, um, but I would ask students to um, choose a specific positive trait that they liked and then um, describe themselves. Uh, I am, for example, hardworking because this, I am grateful because, and it's always very important, especially in self-awareness, we, we, it's very important to, to give students the opportunity to look at their positive values, their, their positive traits, and focus on that. And that's positive psychology. That's, that's what it does. 
we're focusing on positive elements of students and we want to highlight those in the classroom and beyond so they can continue to do that. And I would like to invite you now, all of you, if you would like to please complete this sentence for me, I am, and then you can choose a, a list of positive traits because, and then complete the sentence. If it's okay, let's give you here a few seconds and then you can complete um, this activity for, uh, for us here with us. Social emotional learning, self-awareness. I am blank because blank. Thank you very much, Ian. I am enthusiastic because I enjoy teaching. Love it. I love it. You see, and as you're all thinking, probably as you're writing your responses here, this is what self-awareness does. You know, when you have activities like this, you have to look into yourself and you're like, okay, which positive trait describes me best and why? And that's what you're doing. You're analyzing yourself. You're looking at yourself and your positive traits. Thank you, Andrew. I am motivated because I want to, because I have goals. I am motivated because I want to contribute to change. Gracias. Thank you. I am usually fair because I think about others. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love it. So I invite all of you to use this activity with your students. It could be um, you know, part of an activity in your class. It could be a, um, a warm-up activity. It could be an exit ticket. You know, there are different ways of how you can include this. And of course, it depends on the level of your students. You can make it more complicated, a little bit more, um, you know, um, higher level if you like. Then uh, the next um, competency that we have, and I apologize if I'm stuttering a little bit, it's 2 a.m. here in Poland and my brain is trying to restart, but I think we're doing great. So thank you all very much. Um, so the next competency is self-management and self-management, it's all about regulating our own emotions. And um, it's very important. I, I use the word regulating and notice that, that I, I do not use the word control because emotions should not be controlled or suppressed. They should be regulated. Students need to understand what the emotions that they're, they're feeling are, give them a name, and then regulate those emotions instead of controlling them. Emotions uh, should not be controlled. But then in the next slide, for example, we have an activity of how we can um, include self-management uh, self and, and self-regulation in, in, um, in our classroom or beyond. And this is something that I like to do with my students as well. And uh, we did a quick check-in always in the beginning of the class. And I would ask them, um, today I feel, and then of course you have the kind of the, the most essential, um, you know, uh, we have here some values that are, are and some emotions that are kind of more, um, more uh, popular. I apologize, that's 2 a.m. brain. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I will give them a list. I will go over them uh, with them be, in a day in before. We, we did activities like this, but then, you know, they, they already knew the vocabulary and we had talked about the emotions. But then I would give them this prompt. Today, I feel um, sad, happy, angry, anxious, you know. Uh, then they had to identify a quick check-in how they were doing. And the way that they would do this is in, in a journal, so we always kept journals because I wanted my students to think about their emotions. And then I need to, what do they need to do to regulate that feeling? And uh, if they wanted to, they could talk to us about it or they could just, um, you know, just write in their journal, but they, they could think about, okay, I need to do this today to regulate my feeling. Especially um, students who arrive in the classroom and they were angry about something because a lot of my students had uh, different issues back home. That was a moment for them to detach themselves from, from that and just be in that moment present and realizing, okay, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I need to do to help me. And of course, we went through different activities that they could do. I, I was always giving them uh, strategies that they could do to, to regulate their emotions. Um, also, we also talked about here using uh, emotions as data, which is very, very important, especially when we think about emotional intelligence. Um, 
I would talk to my students, for example, uh, and I have another activity that I'll share with you later about restorative circles, but we did a lot of restorative circles and a lot of conversations. And then in those circles, we would talk about, okay, um, you know, today I'm feeling like this, I'm feeling uh, upset, I'm feeling uh, sad, uh, you know, however they're feeling. And then I would ask questions like this, okay, have you felt like this before? what triggered that, um, that feeling last time? And then using that information as data to see, okay, what do you do last time to help you feel better? If you didn't do anything, then let's try something, you know, and then we will talk about potential ways to, to self-regulate that emotion to feel better. And then uh, if it worked, good, then they know that they can use that approach next time to help themselves, uh, you know, regulate those emotions and feel better. If it didn't work, they can continue and try something different. Um, so the, the different, again, different activities, I'm just giving you here some examples of self-management. Um, the next slide here, we don't have time to go through all of these, but I do want to give you this so you can uh, see it. Uh, there, the last three have links that you can explore after a presentation. Uh, reflective writing is something that I loved. I love doing with my students and my students love doing as well. Um, you can also do self-distancing strategies, which I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about now. Next slide. Also grounding techniques, very important that you can do also grounding techniques with your students. Uh, check out that as well. And mindfulness, of course. We actually are going to talk about mindfulness activities later as well. But again, these are all some, some uh, activities that you can do for self-management. I'm trying to cover as much as possible with the time that we have. Uh, the next slide is um, what I was talking so about, self-distancing. So yeah, so this yes. one, I, I was going to share uh, an activity for you to do um, so that we could actually experience it ourselves, this self-distancing, because, um, you know, a lot of times your students might feel stressed out. Maybe you feel stressed out because you have so many tasks, you know, that your to-do list gets very long. And so if you notice that your students are feeling stressed out, you can help them learn how to manage this by self-distancing. So Here's a, uh, it's called the Eisenhower matrix. So with the Eisenhower matrix, you basically create a grid with your students and then you teach them to prioritize and maybe, you know, something that they've done in their mind, but they haven't seen it on paper. And by seeing it on paper, it really, it helps to, to, to just bring down that level of stress, because as you know, sometimes we just have so much going on. So I want you, if you have a piece of paper close by, please pull it out. And let's make let's make a matrix. Okay, so right here, I have I'm gonna have my paper. Let me take off my uh, my back my video background so that you can see. Let's see here. Hmm. I don't know if I can take off my video background. Oh, here we go. There it is. Ah, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so you start off with a piece of paper, and then I want you to make a make the grid with me. All right, so we're gonna start with the uh, the grid, and then as you see there, think about something, you know, for you personally. What is the most important thing that you need to do today? That it's urgent because you need to do it today and it's very important. Put that in your top corner. And then under that, it's something that you need to do today, but yet it's not as important. So for example, something that is very important that I always have to do every day. So I would put that in my most important section would be to check my emails. I always have to do that every day. Less important, but I definitely wanna do it today would be to clean the house. So see, I have my list here, as you can see in terms of what I would do. So the idea is to do it with your students and maybe it would be those kinds of things, but it could be that you think about what might they say is most important. Maybe the most important thing you want them to focus on is their homework. Perhaps less important is clean their room, but although that's something that they would be doing today, right? And then less important on this side. So the idea is to just distance themselves from the, the amount of things that they might have to do so that they feel 
less stressed. I know something that I do every day for in terms of this kind of self-distancing idea is I put things on my calendar. So I know that if I have one big long to-do list, it's too much, it, it's overwhelming. Maybe you experience this too, I don't know. But if I put this out um, across my calendar, then it makes it much more doable. You know, I see there's 10 things, but now I'm doing one today, two tomorrow, three the next day. And I feel so much better that way. So let's see here. I just was wondering, what do you do if you do anything when you know that your students are feeling overwhelmed with tasks and due dates? Can you type in your chat box? What, what are the kinds of things that you do to help them with that, if anything? And if you haven't done something, maybe there's something that you can think of to do now that you, you know, now that it's brought out here to, to discuss. So recognize their feelings and have them do something to make them smile. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Very good, Alyssa. Any other ideas? Oh, listening to music. Absolutely. And turn off, turn off the lights for a few minutes. Oh, very good. Yeah, that's definitely calming. Thank you, Ian. And here, oh, I have another one. Jeanette. So, so Jeanette says, I took everyone outside and made them leave their computers, devices. And then we had class outside in nature from away from all the other stressors. Yes, definitely good to be out there with nature. Absolutely. It just, it makes, it makes everybody feel better. Absolutely. Well, here's another technique. Maybe, maybe you've done something like this. It's called the grounding technique. And it helps students, once again, feel less stressed, but also to become present because if they have all these things on their mind, like Luis was saying, you know, maybe they're bringing with them, you know, problems from their home or, you know, maybe it's at work that they're, you know, they're having a lot of things to do at work, whatever the issue is. Um, if you do this grounding activity, it kind of helps get them here. So let's take a couple minutes just to do this. So the first one is what are five things that you can see? So just look around your environment right now and count five things that you could see. So for example, I could see the wall, I could see the light, I could see the ceiling. So think of five things. Now, what are four things that you can feel? So I can feel my desk, very smooth. Think about four things. Now, what are three things that you can hear? So type one of those things that you could hear in the chat box. Let's hear what you hear, because I know I can't hear it because everybody's on mute. So let's type that in the chat box. Ooh, Michael hears traffic, pigeons, smooth jazz. Ooh, yeah, nice. My dishes, sorry, I'm washing the dishes. <laughs> That's good. My dog is barking, yeah. Ah, uh, thank you, Luis. <laughs> Cars. Your husband's watching TV. Yeah, cars passing by. So you see the fact that we have been thinking about all these different things. Now we're not thinking about any problem that we might've had, hopefully at least during this grounding technique. So if you did this with students that come into your class or maybe in the middle of class, you take a little break and you do this, now we're back and we're focused and we could continue, so. I love this technique. And it's and it goes as uh, Luce was talking about positive psychology. This is also goes along with positive psychology. So the next competency, so as we said, there was five, is social awareness. And what exactly is social awareness? Well, it's it's being able to recognize the strengths in others, being able to be concerned about them, express gratitude for them, and understand that there are you know diverse social norms. 
And so Luis is going to talk about some restorative circles activity. Yes, thank you, Hilda. And something that I really love doing with my students is uh, restorative circles, especially uh, for, for this particular um, competency of social awareness. And if you're not familiar with restorative practices or restorative circles, usually uh, educators have to, we have to be trained to become circle keepers. I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you a variation the next slide when we get there. But um, if you're already a circle keeper uh, trained professional, then you can do activities like this with restorative circles, which is having conversations with your students about, um, again, how they're feeling, but more than anything, showing um, empathy for others in, in the circle. And then we would talk about different topics. Uh, and usually my students in the circle, they would bring the topics that they wanted to talk about, that they wanted to explore. And um, things like, for example, sadness, happiness, um, how to communicate with other, others better, especially with students that um, English learners, especially if they're learning English as a second language in, in an environment where English is the, the, the dominant language and they're learning that language, there is usually a lot of miscommunication in the beginning, but you know they want to talk about those miscommunications. And the circle is a good, a good place because it's a safe space where they can talk about it, we can learn together, and they become more aware of their surroundings. Also, it could be, you know, we could have a moment of levity and, and just have fun. Like the last question here, what are three words, you know, in another language? And then they will start thinking about different languages and things that they know. And they're still becoming socially aware of their surroundings, of the culture, of the norms, um, what to do, what not to do. We, would, we had conversations, for example, um, and little things like, uh, what is the difference between excuse me and I'm sorry? Uh, because especially for English learners, um, depending on the, the first language that, that they, they speak or the, the first languages that they might speak, um, it might be different, you know, and there might be miscommunication when they should say, for example, I'm sorry, and they say, excuse me, you know, little things like that. Um, it's the restorative circles are a wonderful place to talk about all of these things and become more aware of their surroundings, but also of others. Again, if you're not a restorative, a restorative circle keeper, the next slide, um, this is another variation that you can do, which is listening circles. Uh, and you don't have to be trained uh, for, for to do or to, um, to incorporate listening circles. And I actually gave you here, this is a link um, for an, an article. It's, it's titled, How to Behave and Why, Exploring Moral Values and Behavior in ESO New Comic Classroom. And this is uh, an article that I, 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 read, um, I wrote a while back in high school. And I... I didn't know that I was actually doing listening circles. You won't see the word there because I still didn't have that vocabulary. It was very early in my career, but I started doing these circles with my students where we would talk about moral values, behavior, because I was interested. We had a lot of um, miscommunication and, and cultural uh, differences in, in our classroom. And I wanted to give them a space to talk about, okay, maybe how I see something, it might be different for that for the other student. The other student might see it in a different way. So please check out that article and then you'll see uh, how we did listen in circles and we would talk about uh, different books and different topics. I started bringing a lot of topics, uh, a, a lot of different books about specific topics like uh, honesty, um, um, like moral values, like, you know, kindness, empathy, and then we would read together, and then we would just sit there and talk about that, and then they would talk about how they might see things differently. Just to give you an example, uh, we were talking about one time about honesty, and then one of the students said that um, depending on the on the background, honesty might be seen differently. And uh, she said, for example, you know, where I come from, if you're honest, um, for example, uh, then, or, you know, or stealing, she, she talked about stealing and honesty, uh, where, where I come from, families have to steal to be able to survive and, and, and eat. If not, they won't be able to eat and they'll, they'll die. And, you know, th those are things that teachers might not know or might not be aware of, but it's just different ways of looking at life and becoming more aware of others' realities, right? It's, it's a space to, to talk about their, their backgrounds and then the differences, comparing and contrasting where students come from and then where they are. Um, so again, just some activities here. Check it out. I highly recommend it. And so at least in the chat box, it, it um, oh, somebody yes. asked you, Rebecca asked you, can you tell us about the training? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for that question. For restorative circles, Rebecca, it usually it depends on the school county. In the school county that I was working, they had a summer training for teachers uh, because, of course, all the training for teachers happened in the summer, so we really don't have a break. But it was wonderful. It was a wonderful training. And what they did was that they just we just went through the whole process of restorative circles. And we had my mentor, um, Robin McNair, and uh, she actually took us through through the whole process of restorative circles, and it was very intense, um, um, emotionally intense. And in, in essence, we would do circles with her initially, and then we started leading the circles. And um, it was a two two week uh, two week training, if I remember correctly. But then at the end, we already knew the steps of how to open the circle, how to incorporate pretty much the process of, of uh, incorporating restorative circles and, you know, the opening activity, the, the middle activity, giving space for, for the circle, knowing the, the guide, guidelines, rules for the circle, and then closing the circle at the end. There's actually, uh, at the end of our presentation, there is a link um, that I'm going to share with all of you that you can read more about it. And I talk a little bit more about um, restorative circles and how to include it in your um, in your English classrooms. So there, there is a link at the end that you can read more about it. All right. So now I wanted to share a little bit about wordless books. So wordless books, it, you might be familiar with them, are picture books without any words. And so I, I had um, edited a book called Wordless Books, So Much to Say, that was um, that had activities and lessons for teaching students reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills. But um, but now that Luisa and I have been working so much with social emotional learning, I'm thinking, you know, really you could use a lot of the wordless books to teach social emotional learning too. So for example, in the the book Chalk, um, you will see the the story but I, before I before I get to the story itself I wanted to um to say that a lot of times people say well you know you can't really use wordless books with older students but in a way you can because this book for example if a student is older and you and you frame that frame it that they are like an author and they actually have to um critique the book, or they have to have a dialogue about the book and then write the book, write the story so they're an author. In that way, it, it changes the, the mindset of what's the purpose of reading this book. But in this particular book, it talks a lot about emotions. So as you could see, the, the girl had found some chalk and then she drew the sun on the ground, but then when she drew it, it, it came to life. So you could see their emotions have to do, you know, they're excited, they're happy, they're, you know, looking up together. And then the next girl, she starts drawing butterflies. So as you can imagine, what's going to happen is that the butterflies come to life and they seem extremely excited, right? So you could talk about, okay, so what is it that makes you excited? What is it that makes you happy? You could have, you know, in-depth conversations about that if you really wanted to get into other emotions, such as the emotions of being afraid or being scared, you know, you could talk about it because of this book. Um, so even though the book, you know, you, you would think it's a, a very simple child's book, um, a lot of emotions can be, can be dealt with by looking at them. And there are just so many other wordless books, but I know that something that really excites me about the wordless books is that when I um, have worked with families that are not literate in their own language, and yet when I bring in wordless books, they light up because they are able to participate and they can see how they can help their child um, become you know, motivated to read, even if they don't know how to read, because there's a lot of skills in reading, you know, as such as like, looking at the pictures for comprehension, you know, turning, um, turning the book, the pages from right to left or left to right, depending on which, you know, country you're in, reading left to right or right to left, again, depending on which country you're in. But those things that, you know, you can do with a book just by pointing at, you know, with the parents, um, there are things that they could do even if they can't read. So 
again, I highly recommend using wordless books. So Hilda, uh, in just a moment, we only have five minutes left just to, uh, to share. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I just saw that uh, the Stuart was saying that. So Luis, did you want to, um, did you want to um, take a break for questions, maybe, since we only have five minutes left? Do we have um, after, do we have five minutes of presentation and then 10 minutes of question and answer or just five questions or five minutes in, in total? Um, I'm sure David can confirm this. I believe the session has to end at 9.50, oh, but, there, but there is okay. a Discord server, you see. So attached to the conference, there's a server. People can ask questions and such afterwards. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. David, yes, is, that, yes. is that correct? Just to be sure? Yes. We have to end in five minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. We apologize, everyone. We had a lot of activities. We'll be glad to share them with all of you. Um, Hilda, I think we can go to the question and answer uh, slide at the end and welcome okay. questions. Sure. Let me. Um... Thank you, Stuart, for, for keeping us here uh, focused. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we, yes. Yeah, we... The question slide. Okay, so again, after the session is finished, uh, there's a Discord server where everyone can go to ask questions if there isn't enough time. Uh, but right now, if anyone would like to ask a question, please speak up and ask by all means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much, Gracia. Gracias for sharing here the, the link for the book, um, Social Emotional, Social Emotional Learning from TESOL Press. Thank you very much. And I saw Ethan had shared that, um, that he really liked the wordless books because uh, he's an artist in his personal life. Ah, very interesting. We have a question from Hans Huyang asks, will the PowerPoint be shared? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Um, Any other questions? You're very welcome. I think we- Well, I know um, we only have a couple minutes left, but I just wanted to say, as you're thinking about, okay, you share one more slide. More slide, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe let's go back to one of the activities um, very quickly. The perhaps the bibliotherapy uh, activity that I, that, that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, okay, okay. This one right that here. That one, yes, bibliotherapy. Uh, it's a, it's a, a type of social emotional learning that I love, love, love doing with my students. And what we would do is that we would do a feelings board and then we would explore feelings. And um, I really like doing sing quaints and haiku poems. In the next slide we have, um, this is what I would teach my students how to do sequin poems and haiku poems. And then we would talk about emotions and then they would create these beautiful uh, poems. And then we put everything on the, on the uh, board, the feelings board. Let's go back to that slide very quickly, Hilda. And that's the picture uh, of one of the pictures. And then they would do cards and decorate the classroom with their feelings, but then they would explore the feelings and talk about what they were um, you know, feeling or, or dealing with in that particular moment. And at the end of the day, it always made them smile and, and feel a little bit better. So I highly recommend doing bibliotherapy with them. You'll see more information about bibliotherapy in the slide as well. So when we share the, the slides. Well, I hope you found um, of some of these activities, if not all of these activities, things that you could use in your environments, you know, whether it's a classroom or your workplace. Um, so, and I know David says that he learned a lot. So good, excellent. So happy to hear it. So thank you so much for having us here. We really, we thank really you, appreciate everyone. it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us. And I hope this information, as Hilda said, uh, it was helpful to all of you. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Luis and Hilda. A, a silent round of applause uh, for our two wonderful presenters today. Lots of very positive feedback in the chat there. Thank you both. Very enlightening and very positive. Something to think about. As I said, um, there is a Discord server associated with the conference. So anyone who wishes to ask any more questions or anything like that, please visit the server. Uh, 
drop a link to it in the chat just at this moment. So again, uh, thank you to our two presenters and let's all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.